I don't have anything to do here. I don't know how to move with this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So that is uh, the first step. And I wanted to start by telling you uh, a few things about where I work that relates to what I'm going to talk about this morning. So uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency's mandate is to uh, promote peaceful uses of uh, nuclear uh, resources for health, prosperity, and sustainable development uh, throughout the world. Uh, established in 1957, uh, we are headquartered in Vienna as a specialized agency of the United Nations. And we have our headquarters in Vienna and uh, uh, satellite offices in Geneva, Tokyo, Toronto, and New York. And within this uh, mandate uh, of uh, peaceful uses of nuclear resources, we also have uh, the health mandate where our nutrition sub-program falls. And our objective in the uh, nutrition section is to support the IEA member states uh, to use nuclear techniques to address uh, malnutrition in all its forms and throughout uh, the life course uh, within three uh, sub-themes, uh, early life nutrition. Uh, so we have technologies to, for example, measure breast milk intake and also to determine whether a child is exclusively breastfed and we look at uh, prevention and management of non-communicable diseases and also diet quality and nutrition security. And my talk today would fall more under the last two bullets as we go on. So uh, I'm very sure that in this gathering, I don't have to uh, teach you any uh, uh, chemistry, but uh, for the purpose of what we do, so uh, isotopes, uh, are different forms uh, of elements and they are separable based on differential ma mass uh, that they have different number of neutrons and thus it is the basis on which they are used in nutrition applications. And uh, the most important thing is that uh, stable isotopes have been used uh, in nutrition and health for over uh, six decades and at the rates they are dosed, it is very, very safe and no adverse effects have been reported. So that is what I wanted to say. So in uh, the IEA, we've uh, developed and have established uh, stable isotope techniques and other nuclear-related uh, techniques. For example, if you look at the uh, right side of the panel here, uh, we, as I mentioned, we can look at breastfeeding practices uh, in terms of how much breast milk a child consumes and then depending on how much other waters they are receiving we can determine exclusivity of that breastfeeding and uh, we can also do body composition which i'll uh, mention again uh, as we go on uh, we can do total energy expenditure in relation to physical activity and the risk for uh, overweight and obesity and uh, using uh, dual x-ray absorptiometry uh, we could do bone mineral density, but also fat distribution uh, in the body. And on the other hand, we have a set of uh, isotope techniques to look at diet quality, mainly focusing on uh, nutrient absorption. Uh, for example, of amino acids, uh, iron, zinc, vitamin A, and also bioconversion of provitamin A into active vitamin A. And uh, last but not least, we've been looking at the intersection between uh, nutrition outcomes and environmental exposure, especially related to living in insanitary uh, conditions in low and middle income countries, uh, so-called environmental enteric dysfunction. So uh, with that in mind, um, I don't have to uh, really teach you about the double burden of malnutrition, you are the experts, but uh, so the terminology uh, connotes that we could have multiple forms of malnutrition, uh, both undernutrition and overnutrition if you want, micronutrient deficiencies occurring at different levels in society, household, uh, and even national level or regional, 
but it could also happen within the same individual. And this particular uh, recent uh, uh, paper uh, uh, in the Lancet uh, found that uh, it, uh, you know it is individuals, rich individuals in low and middle income countries, and also poor people in uh, high income countries who are more affected uh, by the double burden of malnutrition. And what is interesting is the this particular review is based on looking at anthropometric data. And so the question is, is anthropometry uh, the right tool to help us understand the dynamics of the double burden of malnutrition? And so if you look at, this is another paper from India, uh, looking at other markers apart from uh, anthropometry, uh, looking, for example, at lipid profile and uh, risk factors for uh, uh, <clears throat> dyslipidemia and, uh, and things like that. And you find that people who look apparently okay based on anthropometry, uh, you find that these people have a problem. They have uh, metabolic uh, obesity, if you can say so. And uh, some of them are already thin, uh, some of them are already stunted, but these are not visible if you really don't go deep and measure something else. So really the message here is that uh, for us to understand the double burden of malnutrition, we need other tools beyond anthropometry and the co conventional uh, methods that uh, we use. And what are the markers that are we can measure with these uh, other tools. For example, uh, we believe that body composition is very, very important and body composition as the term connotes is just what makes up our body. You can look at it at different levels, but um, simply we can look at the body as fat and fat free mass. And we also think uh, this is a, uh, a conceptual framework that was developed by Wooten and Jackson from Southampton, uh, but they kindly allowed us to include it in a modified way in a, a review we uh, did in 2019 uh, to really position body composition as uh, a tool that can be used to look beyond uh, uh, what anthropometry and the others can tell us. So, uh, looking at uh, the panel here, the first uh, circle there, where it says acute malnutrition, that could be any exposure. It could be food intake, it could be adverse env environmental exposure, and also it could be uh, an intervention to respond to that kind of uh, exposure. And you find that uh, we think that body composition sits at the center and it is a more sensitive uh, indicator that trends responds first before it is reflected in weight gain and also in height and perhaps also in mid upper arm circumference and that response then at a certain level is related to short term uh, things like brain growth and development but also to metabolic programming uh, right from in utero and also through uh, infancy and childhood but also later and of course, then finally to long-term uh, things like cognitive education and social performance, and then to immunity, work capacity, and of course, uh, uh, the risk of obesity and other non-communicable diseases. So therefore, uh, traditionally we use, uh, we weigh someone and we measure their height, we calculate body mass index, uh, but uh, this picture here, uh, uh, is an old paper that the summary is that people with the same body mass index will not necessarily have the same uh, body composition in terms of body fat uh, because then body composition is influenced by many other factors, ethnicity, genetics, diet, but also uh, environmental factors. So therefore, uh, one of the methods that the IEA has promoted over time is to use a stable isotope of uh, hydrogen, deuterium, 
uh, to be able to measure uh, body composition accurately. And this is considered among uh, the uh, reference methods. I don't know what I did, yes. Um, so how it works is you collect uh, a baseline body fluid, either saliva, sample, or urine, and then you give someone an accurately weighed dose of deuterium oxide, and then three hours to four hours after, you collect another body fluid. And then, uh, depending on whichever specimen you collected, either urine, uh, you can use uh, an isotope ratio mass uh, spectrometer, or you can use a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer to be able to measure the deuterium uh, uh, enrichment in the saliva sample, or you measure the abundance over baseline, then that will enable you to derive total body water. And once you derive total body water, uh, then uh, there is a hydration factor for fat free mass for based on age and sex. And then we can calculate fat free mass and then knowing body weight, we can work back and uh, calculate fat mass, uh, the difference between body weight and fat free mass. So, so that is how it works. So let me give you uh, examples of how then can you relate these to the aspects of the double burden of malnutrition. So this is um, a study uh, from Ethiopia. So uh, they followed children uh, from birth to the age of five years, and they measured uh, body composition uh, using air displacement, plethysmography, uh, but also in some cases, deuterium dilution. And they find that fat free mass accretion uh, from birth to six months of age was positively associated with length at one year and linear growth between one to five years. Yeah, and that the association between uh, fat free mass and linear growth is stronger within the first uh, year of life. So, so that is one example uh, how you can use body composition. The second is that uh, in a large region, regional project involving nine African countries uh, that uh, we supported. So the ambition was to follow up people who had been uh, in their childhood exposed to uh, either severe acute malnutrition or moderate acute malnutrition. So, so there are different cohorts in these countries. Some were children now four years, some were adults who are now 30 years of age, uh, who are seen in a, a healthcare uh, from 1988, for example. Uh, so this example from Zambia uh, are children who are now seven to 12 years, they were uh, acutely malnourished uh, at before two years of age. And the result uh, after measuring body composition was that children with prior case of severe acute malnutrition were smaller than uh, uh, community controls. And in terms of hip circumference, uh, suprailiac skin fold and fat free mass index as measured with deuterium. Uh, dilution. So um, the other studies from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where again uh, individuals were malnourished uh, 1988. Uh, so now the mean age is 23 years of age at follow up. Uh, so they were severely malnourished with or without uh, any uh, treatment at all and they are compared with uh, sex-matched uh, control adults at the moment. And uh, so they measure, uh, again, uh, body composition using deuterium dilution. And the result is that uh, severe acute malnutrition is associated with reduced fat free mass in adulthood, especially in, uh, in males. And they also looked at different uh, indicators of metabolic dysfunction, like lipid profile and, and all that. Uh, that is in another paper uh, by the same group. So uh, that is body composition. The other component that is really relevant to uh, the double burden of malnutrition is, you know, we are undergoing a lot of uh, 
social transition, but also a lot of uh, uh, population transition from rural to urban. There is a transition in what we eat and also increase in sedentary uh, lifestyle. So therefore, knowing how much energy we take in, but how much we spend is very, very important. So um, using doubly labeled water uh, with deuterium and oxygen 18, we can accurately uh, measure uh, total energy expenditure. Uh, so you, again, like the deuterium, you take a baseline sample, then you do someone and then uh, the, the, the isotopes uh, equilibrate with the body water. Then after 14 days, you take another sample and it is the relative disappearance of the isotopes from the body that gives you uh, the rate of carbon dioxide uh, production, uh, which is the basis for calculating uh, total energy expenditure. And uh, this is linked to physical activity, uh, but could also be useful in designing uh, energy intake guidelines. So, uh, so now uh, the IEA is hosting a database of uh, daily energy expenditure. Uh, this is data collected from over 30 countries uh, over so many years, and there are data points for 7,600 uh, uh, people available uh, in this database. And out of this database, there has been a landmark uh, publication in 2021, uh, the daily energy expenditure through the human life. And uh, this paper is very different because it sets out two main stages uh, through which uh, energy expenditure evolves that at birth, uh, the metabolic rate uh, is more equal to the adult, but uh, during the first year, it increases with a peak of 50% yeah, above the adult level. And then the second window is that uh, it declines in children between one to 20 and the age of 20 years uh, and to reach the adult level. So you start very high in infancy, uh, declines to adult level. But what is more profound is that contrary to the belief that metabolism slows down in adulthood, actually it is slower than previously thought. So this is really the novelty of, of this particular uh, uh, paper. And then after the age of 60 years, then it decreases uh, again. Uh, so this is how you can use these techniques because then we are talking about precision nutrition, individualized nutrition. So you can use this kind of information uh, to address individual level nutrition needs. Um, so that is about body composition and uh, uh, energy expenditure in relation to uh, probably the risk of non-communicable diseases, but the other uh, aspect is diet quality and I wanted to use protein uh, quality as an example today. Uh, so protein quality refers to the ability of a food uh, to deliver uh, essential amino acids uh, in the right quantity but also uh, the right balance uh, and absorbable uh, uh, manner. So and it has three components. One is uh, the amino acid uh, content of the food, and also what is the amino acid requirement of the individual or the population involved, and above all, what is the digestibility of the protein from that particular food. But how do we really uh, measure this? <clears throat> so uh, in uh, 2019, uh, the um, uh, Sam talked about the, the the debate on protein quality, whether protein uh, is still an important nutrient and about the protein gap. Uh, so, and, uh, you know, describe the evolution of this debate from when uh, protein was thought to be important to a point where uh, the, it was thought to be a fiasco. Then now we are back to realizing that protein is indeed very important again. Uh, and 
So the other important thing is that uh, protein recommendations for human populations have been set and they've not been revised over time. And there is now with emerging technology, especially isotope technology, that the existing recommendations are under estimation of the real requirements. Uh, so uh, that is the Elango paper I'm, I'm showing there. Uh, and so the debate has come back, uh, of course, again, uh, 2011, uh, a meeting in Auckland, uh, uh, resulting in the FAO uh, paper number 92 that uh, recommended that dietary amino acids should not be lumped together. They should be looked at differently, but also there need to be a change on the score that is used uh, to really look at uh, protein and amino acid uh, quality. So then uh, this digestible in dispensable amino acid score as opposed to the protein digestibility corrected amino acid score was recommended going forward. And then in 2014, uh, in a meeting uh, convened by the FAO, but also with a, a heavy um, uh, participation of the IEA, uh, there was uh, a identification of methods uh, that can be used uh, to measure protein quality basing on the DIAS. So uh, out of this, the IEA supported the development of a dual isotope tracer technique uh, that can be used to accurately measure amino acid uh, digestion based on DIAS. So basically, you, in this particular study, you grow the bean or whatever food you want and you irrigate it with deuterium uh, then it at maturity, so the deuterium mass uh, equilibrated throughout uh, the bean, and then you take the edible portion, you prepare a meal, and then at the point of consumption, you add another isotope, which is 13 carbon level, either uh, reference amino acid like uh, spirulina or a crystalline amino acid like uh, phenylalanine and then the subject consumes it and then it is distributed in blood but also in breath so you can sample those and then you measure the isotope pressure on the basis of that you can calculate uh, individual absorption of each of the indispensable amino acids and also calculate the DIAS. Um, Okay, so, so these are photos from uh, some of the study sites. Uh, and this is a paper from uh, uh, St. John's Research Institute in Bangalore, India, where they profiled uh, several foods consumed by, you know, uh, ingredients used to make children's food. And in short, the, the, the plant-based ingredients for preparing children's food if you look at the amino acids, especially the uh, methionine, lysine, and also thionine, the, the absorption is very, very low. So uh, what this means is that we foodstuffs that are plant-based are important, but we also need to see how to blend it with other foods, especially animal source foods, uh, to be able to promote uh, optimal uh, child growth. So. I'm just going to mention also, apart from protein, we also have techniques to look at ion absorption. And we've been talking with Douglas earlier, we also have techniques to look at zinc absorption. I'm just showing you what we have in the arsenal. And in summary, with one, uh, my remaining 30 seconds. So innovative tools beyond conventional measures like anthropometry are needed uh, to decipher the complexity of the double body of malnutrition, isotopic and nuclear related techniques allow measurements that are otherwise impossible uh, by these conventional means, e.g. total energy expenditure, body composition, and also protein digestion, as I've just demonstrated. Uh, more work is needed, though, to apply these innovative uh, approaches to measure multiple factors associated with simultaneously uh, can we measure many things at the same time 
and also where applicable, these techniques can be used as validating tools uh, to a, of simpler methods that can be applied in a wider way at the popula population level. For example, deuterium dilution may be used to validate bioelectrical impedance, which can be applied in large nutritional surveys. And lastly, I just want to assure that the IE continue to support countries to apply these techniques uh, to evaluate the impact of different interventions to address the double burden of malnutrition. With that, I thank you and thank the organizers for the, inter uh, the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very interesting. We have time for one quick question. Thanks very much, Victor. That, that was really good. Um, can you say something? So, so most of the measurements you talked about are sort of um, uh, static measurements, if you like. Can you say something about, um, for example, probing metabolism? Because I think there are some tools around probing metabolism, uh, which, of course, is a little bit more dynamic. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we are thinking about this, and uh, one of the areas that we are looking at is around environmental enteric dysfunction. We have a project now uh, relating amino acid uh, absorption with gut health uh, because we think that how amino acids are metabolized is related to how our gut responds, but also our gut's response has an impact on amino acid uh, metabolism in turn. And it turns out that in this particular area, sulfur-containing amino acids are very, very important uh, because they are important for gut epithelial integrity. Uh, so this, my answer is we are just starting to look at this and maybe in the next four to five years, there may be answers, but there has also been uh, a question recently when we talk to experts around tryptophan uh, metabolism, like the tryptophan to kynurenin uh, pathway. How does that relate to uh, many factors, uh, including child growth? Uh, is are amino acids taken away from the growth path? and instead are oxidized. So these are questions that may be answered, including with isotopes, and the work is just starting. So I, my answer is maybe we keep looking at this phase. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Owino. You. Thank you very much.